welcome to this week's installment from the Union City Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're located at 631 East Church Street in Union City, Tennessee. That's at the corner of Home and Church Streets. So we like to say you can find us, you can find community, you can find your spiritual family where home meets church. Good morning. So you saw me over there straightening my music, and then you saw me drop it. So sorry about that, but I got to get it back in order before we do anything. <laughs> the first hymn is See How Great a Flame Aspires. That rings a bell with everybody, right? Uh, uh, still a little laughter. We're going to sing those words to the tune of Christ the Lord is Risen Today, which should be familiar enough that all you have to do is watch the words. I mean, yeah, watch the words. So the choir's going to sing the first verse, and then I'll turn around and get y'all involved on verse 2 and 3. Okay? Maybe they'll show you how it goes. All right? <laughs> Maybe. All right.
Good morning. We want to welcome you to the Union City Cumberland Presbyterian Church on this uh, week of August 15th, 2021. My name is Glenn, and we hope that you're going to really feel at home today worshiping with us. We've got just a couple of announcements today. Uh, first of all, Wednesday night, our normal uh, gathering here for adults, Bible study at 6 p.m. Uh, everybody's welcome, and Michael can tell you more about it if he wants to. But listen, if you've never come before, I want you to understand you don't need to talk when you come. Nobody's going to ask you to stand up and you know, put you on the spot. It's nothing like that. Uh, it's just a great chance to really uh, reflect on God's Word, and that's what we're gathering for. And now's a great time to join. We just started a new uh, uh, study through some of Paul's letters, and Michael may tell you more about that later. But anyway, that's Wednesday night, every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. right here. And then this Thursday is, uh, we've missed it in the bulletin again, several months we've missed it, but it's this Thursday night, the session meeting at 6 p.m. Uh, the session is what we call the ruling council of the church. We've got seven elders who serve in that role. Anyway, if that's you or uh, somebody you live with, please make sure everybody knows this Thursday, 6 p.m. Okay, and then let me tell you about some upcoming things. And uh, this is kind of new, so uh, like perk up your ears and, and see if I can say it right. If I don't say it right, then we'll nix it and we'll talk about it later. Okay, Wednesday, September 8th, that's the Wednesday after Labor Day, uh, we're going to have our big uh, fall kickoff. And what we normally do, and this year we're going to start at 5 p.m., uh, and we're going to have dinner. Uh, Mr. Dwight Grace is going to make burgers. Did you know that? You may not know it. Okay, well, now he knows. Uh, Dwight and friends, hopefully he's going to have a team to help him. And now listen, as the, plan, uh, the plan as it stands now is that the first Wednesday of every month we'll all have dinner together. That's what we kind of used to do every Wednesday. But now we're going to do it the first Wednesday of the month. Everybody's invited the first Wednesday night. Starts at 5 p.m. And if the you know pandemic uh, surges or whatever doesn't get in the way, uh, we're going to return to that tradition. So the first Wednesday of the month, uh, and we're so excited to return to that. And then the other Wednesday nights of the month, the food will basically be for the kids and the youth. Does that make sense? So we have to feed them. I mean, that's an important part of our program. And I want to say, if you want to join us, you can, but it's not going to be like a full meal like we're going to have on that first Wednesday of the month. Does that make sense? It's going to be like hot dogs and chicken nuggets and all that kind of thing. You can come if you want to, but we're not planning it for you. Does that make sense? Okay. So, but the important thing is we hope you'll really put it, uh, mark your calendar. Wednesday, September 8th, 5 p.m., Dwight Burgers. And uh, listen, also, on a serious note, really be praying for our midweek ministry this year, we've got a lot of things changing. We're still coming out of the pandemic, and uh, we're definitely excited to see what God's going to do. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, if you've got any questions, let me know later. Okay, any more announcements today? All right, well, let's uh, pray and just prepare our hearts to praise God this morning. Father, we come today with eager anticipation. Help us this morning to praise you and to proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people everywhere. Amen. Okay, now's the time for any kids elementary school down uh, to join Miss Kelsey for uh, Children's Church. Oh 
charisma in you and you don't know how long I had to think to say that right I had to come up with the word charisma all right so in honor of not don't sit down for a second. in honor of not using the hymnal yet we're still not going to use the hymnal <laughs> so I get in trouble with some people Sally I mean with some people for doing that sometimes um but now we're going to move to Believers All We Bear the Name. It's in your hymnal. But the tune, oh, no, it's not in your hymnal. Well, it should be in your hymnal, but anyway, I don't like the tune. So we're going to sing it to America the Beautiful. That you know, right? These are not challenges this morning. It's so you'll pay attention to the words. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know the song so well, you'll pay attention to the words. All right? Believers all, we bear the name. We don't like the name of the song, but you'll like the words. Okay? Here we go.
Hey, now's the moment when we just um, set aside uh, to, to really give thanks to God. Uh, we know uh, all of us are, are dealing with a variety of things, large and small, but there are always things we can give thanks for, and it's important for us to just zero in on those things and uh, be very conscious of giving thanks to God for that. So let's do that now. Father, we just uh, want to thank you for the ways that you've watched over us. Uh, we confess not everything's gone the way we want. In fact, some things have gone exactly the opposite. And yet, again and again, we know we can rely on you to see us through. We can rely on you to be faithful, even times when we're not faithful or people near us and around us aren't faithful, people we're counting on. We know we can count on you. And so this week, we just want to give thanks to you for Jesus we want to give thanks for the mission that you've given us as your people and help us to always keep uh, your glory and your honor before us. We ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so on Wednesday night, we, are, we have begun the study of Philemon, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, someone from Kenton says Philemon. So anyway, but we went through verses 1 through 7, which is just the introduction, basically. And it's a letter of reconciliation. And I know that we have all needed that, need that, or will need that. So if you have a chance, come join us for uh, that study. There's not as much doctrine in this letter 
of Philemon as there are other letters by Paul because he was trying to reconcile Philemon and Onesimus. So come join us when you can, if you can, and not if you want to, but just when you can, okay? Let's leave it at that. And then um, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, last week I challenged the choir with a seven-minute anthem. You know, they had to stand through that whole thing. And then this week it's only about three minutes. So I'm cognizant of the time, but, you know, yeah. So my way of keeping them in shape. But this week it's 10,000 years and it's an old song, and you probably have a memory of the first time you heard it. First time I heard it was by the Melody Makers from Gleason. And then I think Kristen told me that she grew up singing it with a grandparent on each side. So uh, Sally's probably started crying already with me saying that. But it, it is a special song. The words are. And if you don't know it, you'll, I think, remember it from now on. 10,000 years.
Well, let's pray together. <clears throat> our dear Heavenly Father, we join our hearts t today uh, just to say that your good and your mercy endures forever. There's literally no one like you. When we consider all that you've done, your great power, but also your great restraint out of mercy and love, we're just overwhelmed. And uh, you're so kind to us. You never fail or give up on us. Thank you. Just align our hearts with yours today so that we can give you the glory you deserve. And we ask that in Jesus' name this morning. And then, Father, we continue to pray for those who are in special need this season. Uh, we'll name some. Uh, Brock Martin, we're praying for him continuing to. Uh, he had a, a little uh, trip to the ER this week, but we're thankful uh, it was not that big of a situation. And so we just continue to pray for little Brock. Uh, we're praying for uh, Peggy Vaughn, uh, who's quite sick this morning. Uh, we're praying for Denise Lee, continuing to pray for her health situation. Uh, praying for Trent Arnold and the things he's been dealing with. Father, we continue to pray for Wiley and uh, Teresa Winter. Uh, we're praying for Glenda Griffin, someone we hold so dear in our hearts. We're praying for Betty Trout as she continues to get better and recovering from uh, her hospital stay. Uh, we're praying for Brother James Westbrook and Miss Darlene, uh, praying for them. We're praying for Miss Shirley Hollowell. Uh, that she continues to get stable. We're praying for Helen Clifford, uh, hoping that she can uh, be sustained and, and doing well. We're praying for Miss Sarah Bradley, who we uh, care for so much. We're praying for Mr. Vaughn Westmoreland, Lord, never far from our thoughts and hearts. Uh, we're praying for our brother Jeremy Powell, the pastor over Crosswind. He's home now, but we continue to pray for him and his family and his church. Uh, pray for Miss Cynthia Duncan and all of her health issues. Uh, and there's so many more, Father. I mean, Joanne Smith, we're praying for her uh, daily and just so many. And Father, then we also know there are some we don't name because they request or require discretion. Uh, maybe we know there are some in this room that have requests. We don't speak out loud, but Father, we do lift them all up to you today. And as we do that, then we also ask that you hear us. Now, as we join our voices together and we recite in unison uh, the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, well, we're continuing our study through the book of James. If you've got a Bible there in front of you or a Bible app, whatever it is, you can go there now. We're in chapter 3 today. We're calling this series Faith Works. That title and the graphic even is from a pastor named Matt Chandler down in Dallas. Uh, but um, the truth is, faith works. Faith just works, but we're also asking the question every week, which is more important, our faith or our works, right? This is the theme of, of this letter by James. The most important thing, is it what we believe or is it what we do? Now, James has been talking about problems in the church. Now, I've never known a church that had problems, did you? For heaven's sake. He's talking about problems that happen among Christians because we're redeemed, but we're still human. Okay, and we read a couple of weeks ago about the dangers of showing partiality or favoritism in church. And the scenario seems to have been that uh, rich people were being sort of honored and privileged and uh, poor people were being ignored uh, or neglected. And so James says you can't do that because we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we noted that he said showing favoritism, it's not just a small thing, right? It's not just a, a mix up, it's a sin. It breaks God's law, he said. It goes against the very heart of God's intentions for us in community. And he even says it's associated with evil thoughts. Now hold on to that just for a second. To show favoritism in church is associated with having evil thoughts. And this is a theme uh, James is going to return to in today's text. Uh, you know, often we want to dismiss uh, when we do uh, things that are wrong. And we're going to say, well, you know... Uh, I screwed up, but, you know, it's not that big a deal. 
And James, in effect, says, no, no, no. It's not just about us, you know, just making a mistake. He wants us to see that there's a source. There's a kind of inspiration behind those times when we let ourselves get a little bit out of control. Now, I don't have permission to tell this story, but just a couple of days ago, I was talking with my wife, and uh, I was stressed about uh, two or three different things, doesn't matter what. And, uh, okay, listen, I felt somehow she wasn't listening to me. Uh, she's listening to me now, I promise. But uh, whether she was listening to me or not, it's immaterial to me telling the story. But I was trying to warn her about something, uh, something I felt she needed to take care of because it could get complicated. And somehow I just felt, oh, you're not listening to me. You know, and she kept responding to things that weren't the point, I thought. And so I got all cranked up. And she's like, what are you doing right now? Shh. And she literally did like this. Just, you don't have to, you're like, whatever. And later, uh, I had to apologize because when she said that, I tried to justify myself. Now, I know you guys would never do that, react that way. But I tried to say, no, you, listen, you need to listen to me. I'm just trying to. And I had to apologize because we both knew the issue. It wasn't in that moment whether I was right or wrong. I mean, the issue was me getting all jacked up and talking to my wife. Now, here's the thing. Let me just say this. The topic wasn't about anything of me and her. I was trying to talk to her about something else. But what happens, now listen, what happens sometimes is we get into these moments and what matters the most, we feel, is being heard and getting our message across. And some of you, listen, uh, there's a shadow of recognition which just has fallen over you. Maybe it's your, your family members. Or maybe it's a spouse or an ex-spouse where that kind of situation can turn so dark so quickly. But now listen, James has already told us. He said, be quick to hear. Do you remember? Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And as I've studied James's letter these last several months, uh, I've just noticed how often he talks about our speech. In every single chapter, you'll see it as we go through, Every chapter, he's warning us about how we communicate. Well, James today is going to talk about taming the tongue. And all through scripture, we hear about the power of our tongues, our speech. In Proverbs, for example, here's what King Solomon says. Now, King Solomon, remember, he was the wisest person, it's claimed, to have lived up to that point. We're talking more or less 3,000 years ago, give or take a few decades. 3,000 years ago, the wisest man who'd ever walked the earth, Solomon, said this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Like if I was holding the mic, I'd just drop the mic right now, right? Listen, I really want you to think about that for a second. If you're taking notes, or even if you're not taking notes, take a note, okay? Get some paper or put it on your phone. Just write P-R-O-1821, because it's Proverbs 1821. And spend some time this way. If you get nothing else out of this message this morning... Just think about that sentence, especially that second part. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. There's a lot of rich, rich meaning and wisdom in that. And what we say, though, here's the thing. What we communicate can have the power of life or death. It's that important. So let's hear what James has to say about all this. Again, we're reading in James chapter 3, starting in verse 1. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, he's not necessarily talking about being a school teacher here. I think you understand that. Uh, However, let me just take a little moment to just bracket this out a little bit. I would guess that every single one of us, uh, most of us anyway, have at least one teacher that we've experienced in our life that had a huge influence on uh, who we thought we were and uh, how we lived. For me, uh, the first one that came to mind was Mrs. Pirtle. Mrs. Pirtle was my fifth grade teacher. Now, that we're talking 45 years ago, but she invited us to dinner at her house and just groups of three or four. Now, I don't even know if you could do that today. They'd probably sue you for you didn't give them what food they liked or something. But anyway, uh, we went to her house and somehow, you know, she had made this amazing dinner and we ate in her dining room. Her husband was there and there were three or four of us uh, per night. I assume she did this for everybody. I, I was the teacher's pet, I will tell you that. But anyway. <laughs> But I think she did it for everybody in the class. And so anyway, and so, but when she did that and invited us to her home and treated us like we were so, you know, grown up or whatever, and it made us feel like that. It made us feel she wanted to know us, that she respected us. You get what I mean. 
The second teacher I think of is Mrs. Torionis, Mrs. T. She was my 12th grade English and humanities teacher. And I used to love when I was a little kid, but as I got older, we were just reading stuff in school. I didn't care anything about it. I just thought it was so boring. And Mrs. T, Mrs. Torionis, she just made us feel reading was so much fun again. And I mean, it's affected my whole life since then. Uh, anyway, I think about Senora Miles. Now you can guess, she was a Spanish teacher. Mrs. Miles was our ninth and 10th grade Spanish teacher, and she was so mean. I'm telling you, she, the minute we walked in the class, she went, silencio! You know, everybody was like, oh, whatever. And we were miserable in her class. But uh, I'll tell you this story, because any of my buddies, man, that we were in school together, if they were here right now, and I said, Mrs. Miles, they would tell you this story. I kid you not, there was one day, we, we would go to her class right after lunch, and they would always cut the grass right outside the, the room, and that made her so mad because it was so loud, right? And I kid you not, one day she got so angry, and she went over to the window, and she went, <clears throat> and within five seconds, the mower blew up. Smoke came out, and the guy jumped off, and she just, she just turned around and went, you know, and anyway. But here's the thing. We did not like being in her class, but I got to tell you, she was the best teacher I had, just about. She was tough, but she really did teach us. Okay, here's my point. Look, that's too much side talk. Side talk. If you're a teacher, okay, if you're working with kids, I want to encourage you today so much. What you're doing is so important. Am I telling the right thing, right? We're so thankful for our teachers in this community and in this church. We've got so many, and I know you know how important your job is uh, but it helps to be reminded, we all know this last year has been so extraordinary, so exhausting, and uh, you may feel defeated or demoralized, like, hey, what's the point? This is so frustrating. But you never know how your words and how your actions can affect your students. We're gonna, we want to stand with you the best we can. Okay, that's like school teachers. But here, you understand, James is talking about teachers in the church. Teachers in the church, and it's not just preachers, but he's talking about Sunday school teachers, uh, all those who work with kids or youth at the church. But why would he say, this is very interesting, that we teachers will be judged with greater strictness? And literally what he says in Greek is a greater judgment. It's because what and how we teach will have such an effect on the people that we're teaching. Right? You know, some people are attracted to being the teacher uh, being up in front. I'm talking about at church now, remember. Uh, for better or for worse, I would gladly avoid it. I'd gladly sit up in the balcony and help them with the tech stuff if I could. But some people, they just really get off out of being up at the podium and, uh, and uh, feeling it. They love feeling they're important and sort of flapping their lips or whatever. And James says, hey, man, you need to be careful. You need to be careful about that. Not many of us should seek out those kinds of roles because it's a huge responsibility. He says... For we all stumble in many ways. I want you to notice, he doesn't say some of us stumble in a few ways. This is another line you can meditate this week. We all stumble in many ways. What a call to humility for every person in, this, in, 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 the, in the faith family. We all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able also to bridle his whole body. So the suggestion James is making here is that what we say affects our entire lives. If we don't stumble in what we say, in other words, if we um, can bridle our tongue, we can also bridle our bodies. And then he gives examples of what it means to bridle. He says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they can obey us, so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. He's comparing that to controlling our own tongues. He says, look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Uh, some of you guys remember the name Adrian Rogers. He once preached a sermon on this text, and he called it uh, the meanest member in our church. And he said, I want you guys to take five seconds, look around, and we're going to vote on who's the meanest member in our church. But the point he was trying to say is a joke, right? The tongue is such a small member, such a small part of our body relatively, but small things can lead to great results. And matter of fact, that's our big idea for today. Small things can lead and cause great results. 
James says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Now hear this carefully. James is saying that there is an evil inclination within us that may at times be the source of this desire that we sometimes have to use our tongues, our speech, in hurtful ways. David Nystrom is an expert on James. He says this is a warning that slips of the tongue. We, we talk about that sometimes. Oh, just a slip of the tongue. He says that may not be so innocent and harmless, but may very well represent the initial stages of, he says, quote, a growth of evil within us. Now that sounds serious to me, does it to you? He says the danger is that when we speak or communicate in ways that stir up darkness in ourselves or in others, it's not a mere accident. Oh, I just lost control. He says, no, the source is hell itself. Now listen, just uh, follow with me for a second. This word that's translated hell in English is the Greek word gana, gana. And it's a transliteration of the Hebrew word for a place that we call in English the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. And in the Old Testament, the Valley of Hinnom was the site of worship of these Canaanite gods. You've heard of them, Baal, B-A-A-L, and Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H is the way we write it in English. And associated with the worship of these Canaanite gods, as well as some others, in this Valley of Hinnom was, among other things, they would sacrifice children. They would take their children and sacrifice them and burn them in this valley in the fire. And Jeremiah in the Old Testament, he said uh, that this valley would, uh, would be a place of judgment. Uh, he called it the valley of slaughter, we translate it in English. Uh, because, and he called it that because of all the Jews that were being uh, killed and thrown into that valley, that exact valley, and burned when the Babylonians were taking them off to exile. And some of you have been here around a year or so, you know we've been talking about Babylon and exile, like this sort of thing. And so Jeremiah called that same valley the Valley of Slaughter. And so during the time of Jesus then, several hundred years later, time of James, this valley became linked in people's minds, uh, Nystrom says, with the idea of a fiery judgment. And so Gehenna which is the name of that valley, was associated with the fires of hell and therefore hell itself. So James says, set on fire by the fires of hell. So what James is saying here, when he says the tongue is set on fire by hell, Gana, is that the source of our trouble is not something innocent. We're not just slipping up. The trouble is literally hellish. He says, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Friends, I got to tell you, you know, sometimes there are topics that are so difficult uh, to talk about and to teach because it hits too close to home. And some of you know, for me, this is definitely one of those passages. Uh, but it's especially hard when you realize, listen, the full force of what James is trying to say here. The problem isn't just me being careless and getting cranked up talking about something. It's not just me not being thoughtful. The problem, James says, is a kind of restless evil. A deadly poison within me that I can sometimes allow to fester. It's a fire that devours a world of unrighteousness, he says, and the source is is hell itself. It's not just me being careless. So here's the question. Are we using our speech to build up or to tear down and divide? How is our speech, what we say, affecting others, especially our kids? And you know, some of us don't have kids. Uh, okay, fine. What about those kids that are around us? Uh, David Nystrom, uh, again, he's an expert on James. He tells the story of Winston Churchill 
Uh, Winston Churchill was ignored by both his parents. Some of you may know this story. Uh, his father detested him, uh, and his mother just paid him no attention. He had horrible results in school. Uh, he, he was strong in some areas, but he had weak marks in other areas, and so it ended up that he was usually the bottom of his class. And uh, that just seemed to confirm to his parents uh, that it, he was the right one to ignore. To, they didn't need to pay any attention to him. When he graduated from, uh, um, I think it was Sandhurst Military Academy, it took him three times to get in. He did finally get in and graduate, and he thought that his father was going to be so proud of him because he, he did it. Uh, but instead, his father was furious that Winston hadn't scored well enough to make it into the uh, famous 60th Rifles. It was a, a crack infantry regiment. And instead, he had to settle for the cavalry. Uh, and so his father was Lord uh, Randolph Churchill. Uh, he was a successful politician, member of parliament in his own right. But he wrote Winston Churchill a letter, his son. This was when he graduated from the, the military academy. This is what he said. Check this out if you hadn't read this before. He says, do not think I'm going to take the trouble of writing to you long letters after every failure you commit and undergo. I no longer attach the slightest weight to anything you may say about your own acquirements and exploits. If you cannot prevent yourself from leading the idle, useless, unprofitable life you've had during your school days and later months, you will become a mere social wastrel, one of the hundreds of the public school failures, and you will degenerate into a shabby, unhappy, and futile existence. If that is so, you have to bear all the blame for such misfortune for yourself. And he ended the letter with the words, your mother sends her love. <laughs> I mean, he thought his father was going to be proud of him. He finally did it, something good. And this is what he got. Now look, Winston Churchill, we all know, if you know anything about history, extraordinary person, uh, maybe the greatest personality of the 20th century. Uh, the world owes him a great debt. I believe that's true personally, I think so. But if your argument, argument is that uh, your kids need you to be cruel to them so that they'll be tough, I, I don't know how to respond to that. Listen, church, we've got children in our midst. They're, they're here among us. Uh, don't you think uh, they're cute and all this, but that is, just, that, that is not really that meaningful, Right? We need to be encouraging them and thinking about how can we build them up and train them up. And also, not only that, encourage our young men and women that are in our church. Find ways to teach and build them up. So our words have a big impact on those who are younger, especially that are around us. Kids, young men and women. And then finally, I almost hesitate to bring this up, but what about uh, social media? Yeah? I mean, really, what about social media, especially politics, uh, everybody calm down now, but let me say, I seldom get on social media unless I need to check something. So if you've posted something in the last 24 hours, I don't know about it. I'm not even going to look at you. I'm not directing this to anybody. But here's the question. Are the things that you're posting on social media helpful to anybody? Are you encouraging people? Or are you just trying to signal what you think is right or your politics, or you're trying to make jokes, are you mocking or dismissing certain kinds of people or challenging people, you know, in a sort of aggressive way by what you say online? But I'm right what I said, man. Right, Brother Glenn, I'm right. Don't you agree with me? I mean, look, does it matter? Like, really hear me, that question. Does it matter? Did you accomplish anything by posting that meme or sharing that thing on Facebook or whatever? You know, the one great lesson of social media, for heaven's sakes, is that no one gets their mind changed by a meme or some joke that's, that's making fun of them. What is it that, that deadly poison, James says, within us, that stirs us to be so casual about saying things that we know are divisive? Oh, we know it's not divisive among people who think the way we think, but what does it help? You know, there's an old example of a children's sermon. I almost guarantee somebody's done it in this altar where you take a tube of toothpaste. You guys know what I'm telling? And you unscrew the toothpaste and you squeeze it and it comes out and you say, okay, kids, help me put the toothpaste back in the tube. Ah, you can't put it back. And then you say, kids, that's what it's like with our words. Once you say it, you can't put it back in. Yeah, we all know that, except that online, it's forever, man. It never goes away. It never goes away. And I believe James wants, James wants us to understand that how we talk, how we communicate, both within the church, of course that's important, 
but also just in society, online. It really does matter. Small things, the tongue, the text, the post, can cause great results. But they can also bring pain and division. May God help us to be mindful of the small things that he might one day entrust us with greater and greater things. Let's pray. Father, we just beg you this week to help us to meditate on the power of our speech. We hear James's message and we want to honor you with our tongues, but help us to realize our need for your spirit that we might have the power to overcome our temptations and that we might be good witness, witnesses to your character and love. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing the second verse of Higher Ground, number 399, verse 2. If you will, stand together as we sing. Brother Glenn comes to give the benediction. Our benediction song today is a response. I'll read the words in white and you can read the words in blue. All right? Okay. Receive this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all both now and forever. Amen. God be in my head, God be in my eyes, God be in my mouth, God be in my heart, God be with me as I go and at my returning. Amen. This has been a presentation of the Union City Cumberland Presbyterian Church. We're located at 631 East Church Street in Union City, Tennessee. That's at the corner of Home and Church Streets. Come find us. Come find community. Come find your spiritual family where home meets church. Have a great week. We hope to see you again next time.